I really liked last week's episode, Dan, when you and I were going through all the different season finales and what worked for us and what didn't work for us. But we didn't include series finales because those aren't season finales. So, you know, it just seemed appropriate. Let's go ahead and talk about series finales today. I'm into it. Yeah, let's do that. It, it did kind of feel a little bit uh, that they were missing from last week's discussion. So it'll be fun to talk about those because they were definitely in the back of my mind last week. Yeah. And I know you and I talked before. It's like, well, maybe we should wait until there's a new series finale, but we don't know when we'll get a series finale <laughs> again. Yeah, we don't know. And, and hopefully not anytime soon. Right. I mean, you know, Discovery's going into its for, into its fourth season. They're filming now. Uh, Lower Decks and Picard are only going into their their second season. So hopefully all of those will be running for quite some time to come. I hope so, too. And, you know, I'm very positive that they will because this is Positively Trek because we're just positive about stuff like that. So hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Bruce Gibson. And that wonderful voice you were hearing earlier was Dan Gunther. How you doing, Dan? We both need haircuts, <laughs> I can see. Oh, man, do I ever need a haircut? I've got my my ears are slowly disappearing here. Yeah, if I, if I don't have it pulled back, it's in my eyes. It's crazy. So uh, I, I see we're kind of in the same boat in that respect. I was coming coming downstairs to record with you and I said to my wife well I'm going downstairs to record with Dan she's like okay and after that I'll cut your hair but I've been hearing that for a few weeks from her and it just (laughs) seems to never happen so I think she's gonna do it this time because usually I've I brought it up this time she brought it up so nice I've briefly entertained the thought of Nikki cutting my hair but I think we've both agreed that that's probably a bad idea (laughs) so so with COVID how have you been getting your hair cut Uh, I actually, the last time I got my hair cut was about two weeks before my wedding in July. So uh, I have not had it cut since then. It's just growing out and longer. It's still in a position where I can do something with it and it looks not too bad. I actually kind of like the way my hair looks right now, but uh, it's very quickly approaching the time when that will not be the case. (laughs) I'm impressed. It looks good. I'm not at man bun territory yet, and I I pray that I never will be. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it doesn't matter how long our hair is or not, because I mean, we're going to talk Star Trek stuff. And before we go into talking about series finales, there's a few news items we just kind of want to briefly touch on. And I have to say, I heard about this, but I didn't get to see it. So on Inauguration Day of President Joe Biden, I did watch the inauguration throughout the day, but I forgot that there was a celebration that evening until the next day. My boss is telling me how much she enjoyed the musical performances. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I didn't even tune into that. And then I heard Yo-Yo Ma performed, and I love him. I love string instruments. I love how he plays the cello and stuff. I heard that he played Amazing Grace. But then I heard that he started it with the Star Trek fanfare. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I, I thought this was a joke. I mean, just because I was like, why would he play the Star Trek fanfare right before Amazing Grace? And sure enough, I went on YouTube and there it was. I loved it. I geeked out (laughs) over that. It's really amazing. I I loved this as well. I didn't watch it on the day either. I had this posted somewhere and, and saw it after the fact. But really wonderful, just the opening few strings of the the Alexander Courage's original Star Trek fanfare before leading into Amazing Grace and a number of other songs that are kind of all put together in this uh, interesting compilation, I guess. I'm not sure the right word, but yeah, it, absolutely beautiful. And his words before he started out too, and he was talking about during the last year, there was a little bit of hope leading us towards a brighter future. And that, to me, I was like, oh, he's talking about Star Trek there. That was so cool. (laughs) Oh, it's so beautiful. This is amazing. Is he a a Trekkie? Like, I've never known this about him. I just... Whose idea was this? I guess I want to know, was it his or somebody else's that said, you should do this? I feel like I heard years ago that he was a Trekkie, but I don't know where that comes from or if that's correct or if that's something I'm making up in my head. Like, I seem to remember some sort of something linking Yo-Yo Ma and Star Trek and me going like, oh, that's cool. But I, I can't tell you for sure. Given what he says and how he says it and his just face as he's doing these opening notes here, I have to believe he's a Trekkie. That said, the look of like joy on his face when he's doing anything musical, that's just kind of how he does it. 
and it's beautiful to watch. He's an amazing, amazing person. He is, yeah. And what he says that before it, it just shows it's almost the message of Star Trek is what he was conveying in that opening monologue before he started playing. So, wow, I wish I would have saw that live because that would have really blown me away. <laughs> <laughs> I saw somebody online speculating that this might be his audition to do the opening theme for Star Trek Strange New Worlds. <laughs> How cool would that be? Opening theme by Yo-Yo Yo Ma. <laughs> Sold. Bring it on. Hey, do a whole CD of Star Trek music. That would be great. The whole soundtrack. Um, okay, don't get my hopes up. Uh, that's so great. Well, and uh, shout out to the person who made that connection on uh, our Facebook group. I think it was, it was Tristan Schwartz said that he figures he's uh, trying to audition for Strange New Worlds. So if that turns out to be the case, Tristan, we will credit you with figuring that one out. Absolutely. And we'll have you on a show with Yo-Yo Ma. That would be Ooh, great. Too. There we go. Make that happen. Eh, we'll see. <laughs> so, you know, looking at trekmovie.com, I saw that they had posted the other day, it was on January 18th, a bunch of little segment uh, from different interviews from the cast of Discovery talking about the new season that they're filming now, season four. So I thought we'd just kind of review some of these comments. There's nothing earth shattering. There's no spoilers unless you haven't watched season three or you haven't watched season three. You don't care about season three. <laughs> but there was an interview with Doug Jones with Psy Fanatics, and he spoke briefly about Saru's story and where it picks up in season four. And he says, I think he's been missing Kaminar and his people and his customs. So he'll lap that up for a while. He has Captain Rank with Starfleet. He worked very hard to get that. He made that his life's mission. So I think we're seeing a wrestle between his allegiance to home and his new allegiance to Starfleet for the second half of his life. He is not going to give up either one, I don't think. So I think season four, we are going to see how he balances those things together. I kind of expected this is probably the direction they're going to go in for sure. It's like he's, I don't think he's going to give up Starfleet and I don't think he's going to give up Kaminar, it's like, how does he balance the two together? Mm -hmm. I like this idea of the story for Saru going forward, the kind of pull between what his culture dictates and, and his allegiance to that and his allegiance, like you say, to Starfleet here. I think that could make for some really interesting character dynamics. I love that this is hopefully setting a lot of people's minds at ease who, you know, I think some people watched the Discovery Season 3 finale and said, oh, it's too bad Saru's off the show now. And no, he's not. He's filming Discovery right now, and he's very much a part of it. I, I saw a Twitter thread where uh, somebody had made a comment of that sort, and Doug Jones replied to that and said, no, no, I'm here. I'm in makeup. I'm I'm doing Saru, and, and I have a speaking part. Don't worry. <laughs> so... Yeah, no, it's great to know that he has a big part in season four, for sure. It makes me wonder if the writers just went with this idea of him returning to Kaminar and then saying, well, we'll figure it out in season four, how we bring him back, or if they did that knowing what the plan was. That's a good question. There's, Star Trek has a long history of setting things up in one season and then not knowing how they'll pay it off in the next season kind of thing. Like even just in the case of a two-parter, but also in the case of like long season arcs and that sort of thing. So, you know, I think when they traveled forward to the 32nd century at the end of season two, they knew they'd be in the future, but they didn't necessarily know what that would look like yet or, or how that would all play out. That's, you know, that's the problem for future them. So, <laughs> you know, but now of course yeah. they're, they're working through it now and, and crafting what I'm sure will be a wonderful story for season four. Well, we also have had Oyan Aladijo speak with Bleeding Cool about her character of Owo in this new season. She says, based on where we left off in season three, there's a shift within myself I'm recognizing in myself where Joanne is always ready to fight. Season four will test her resolve more and we'll see her more on track. More on track. Hmm. Not more on track, but more <laughs> on track. So it sounds like she's going to be uh, pretty actively physically fighting some more. It sounds like <laughs> it. I mean, we did see in season three, you know, first the mirror Awoshikun and then the Awoshikun of our universe or, or, or the prime universe, I guess, getting some uh, fighting in. So, you know, let's let's see these background characters that have been traditionally re relegated to the background in Discovery a little bit more front and center and a little bit more uh, active. I'm really excited for that. Yeah, I'm glad we got to see more of her 
her character this season. Yeah, I would like to see a little more of some of the others that we haven't seen as much too. But I know it's all a matter of timing. There's only so much time you can give to each character. But as we go through, I'd like to see them more developed and and get to know them more. So that's exciting. Well, the next part of this I'm really interested in. So this is talking about Grey, who, of course, is the previous host of The Tall Symbiont. And uh, we've seen him in season three, but kind of as a non-corporeal imagining or appearing just to Adira, except in the the last couple episodes there. So the showrunner or co-showrunner, I should say, Michelle Paradise, talked with Inverse about how season four is going to pick up the story with Grey. So she says, representation matters. It matters to see a version of yourself on screen. It matters there are non-binary and transgender characters. It matters that there is a black woman in the captain's chair. It matters that there is a gay couple on our show. We will continue to do that for the show and the world we live in, but also to honor the Star Trek legacy. And to be super clear, we will pay that moment off in season four. Grey will be seen. That promise will be paid off. So I do love, we of course had Culber say, we'll figure out a way to have you be seen, truly seen by everybody. And I love that they're picking that up and running with it. So I'm excited to see Ian Alexander and Gray having a, a larger role and visible to everyone in season four at some point. It's an interesting concept that we can see and the crew can see a past host of a trill. And it would be interesting, too, if it can see other past hosts. I would think that would part would be interesting. Now, with Gray, I think it would be funny if they make a hollow of Gray and Gray says to Cobra, you know, I really appreciate all the effort you put into making me seen, but I'm really not a Vulcan. <laughs> I know you saw me that way before, but I'm really not that way. <laughs> yeah. Huh. I never thought of that. Because, yeah, Culber has never seen Gray's true appearance. So that's that's interesting. Well, how would the Hollow know the appearance of someone? I guess from their memories? Yeah, I don't know if it's maybe your own self-image of yourself or something like that. At least in the case of Gray, because he wasn't corporeal, I guess. So I, I don't know. That's a good question. Oh, wow. I mean, if, if the hollow kids see what I see, I see 30 pounds off of me right now. Well, you're you're a real actual person, though. So the, ho- <laughs> the holodeck would just see you as you. So darn. Nice try, uh, though. Oh, nice wow. Nice try. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. Yeah. Well, another character we had was our Andorian character of Rin, and uh, the actor who played Rin was on Reddit AMA. What is AMA, anyway? Ask Me Anything. Ask Me Anything. Well, we'll ask the actor anything. Noah Averbach Katz was on and said, nothing on the books to be back yet, but obviously I would love to be back, and I would love to come back in prosthetics. I kind of have a taste for it now. Of course, I say that now. And then later he says, I like to think I could be two Ferengi standing on each other's shoulders in a trench coat. <laughs> I love that. I loved, <laughs> I would love to be a part, whatever the Cardassians are up to in the future, or I'd love to be a new species and get the chance to create some new canon. I agree, Noah. I would love to see a new species. That would be really cool. You know, the the title of this section in the Trek movie article where he says Averback Katz is up for another prosthetics role. I read that and was thinking like, oh, he's up for a new role. Like he's he's in consideration for a new role. But no, he's up for it as in he's he's into doing it. So they they tricked me for half a second. But no, this is really exciting. I would love to see him back. He's such a huge Star Trek fan and was a great presence in this last season of Discovery. I ended up loving Rin And uh, really sad to see that character gone. So hopefully seeing the actor back would be wonderful. Yeah, so um, there's more things in here too. We're not going to go through it all, but the article was Star Trek Discovery cast and showrunner reveal more season four plans for Saru Gray and Awosakan. And that's in trekmovie.com. And uh, towards the end of the article, there's some tweets from some other people. And one here that's a little interesting to me is the actress who played the monster on the ship, Sakal's monster on the holiday. Mm. There's just a little things in there if you guys want to go check out. That's really cool. My favorite here is actually the tweet by Dr. Aaron McDonald, the science advisor on uh, Discovery, who I would love to pick her brain at some point, but the Verubin Nebula, and I'd heard this elsewhere, it was named after the astronomer Vera Rubin. So... Very cool. Yeah. And David Ajala has behind the scenes things from uh, shooting Discovery. He, you know, he plays book on the show. And then there's some uh, artwork, animated images of Captain Killy, 
is in here too. Okay, and then before we get to the series finales and what we think of those, real quick, we've got the official news that CBS All Access will be changing its brand name to Paramount Plus on March 4th. And that's really all that's we need to say about that. Yeah, no, this is good. <laughs> I mean, Paramount, of course, a more recognizable brand, I think, a more... Uh, a longer lived brand and more staying power maybe. So I think it's a good change. Also, I do note that they do say that no price changes have been announced for the rebranded service. So it's a possibility, but nothing's been announced there. So don't get too worried yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there'll be a price change at some point. <laughs> it's going to happen. It is the way of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, really, this service has changed over time. It really was just CBS content. And now it has expanded throughout the whole Viacom CBS library of brands like MTV and BET and Nickelodeon and such. So it's already made a step beyond CBS. So it just makes sense that that branding's there. But nothing changes for Star Trek. All your favorite Star Trek series, old and new, are in there. Maybe we'll see all the movies placed in their library. We'll just see how it goes. So, yeah, it's just a brand name change at this point. I do wonder with Nickelodeon being under that umbrella if Star Trek Prodigy will appear on Paramount Plus and how soon it would appear on Paramount Plus after it's possibly released elsewhere on Nickelodeon. Yeah, I don't know. I'm curious, too, how they're going to play that. There's this fine line between cable networks and then the streaming services. And when they have their foot in both, do you put a series in one place and then, for example, on the cable network and wait to put it on the other service? Or do you not put it on the other service? Or do you have it in both places at the same time? Yeah, I'm curious to see how they work that out. Regardless... Even if you don't have cable, I know a bunch of you out there like me would find a way to watch Prodigy. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Legally, that is. So speaking of series, I'm interested in talking about these series finales with you, Dan, because some of these are finales and some just happen to be finales. Yeah, it's kind of the same situation as the season finales last week. So some of them are just regular episodes that happen to be the final episode of the series. And I think we'll see that in, you know, very early on. And then later on, of course, in the later Star Trek series, they're big events. They're big, huge happenings. You know, the end of a uh, long running, in most cases, series that are something to be celebrated. And in some cases, even having sports arenas purchased out for crowds to watch them. Wait, that happened? That happened. I remember seeing live coverage, I think it might have been in Denver, for the Star Trek The Next Generation season fina series finale, excuse me, All Good Things. Star Trek used to draw that into a sports arena. It's crazy. Wow, I don't know if I knew that. If I did, I forgot about it. That's interesting. Man, that would be fun to go do that in a sports arena. That's a lot of people, though. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I don't know. That many people would show up or not. I'd love to know more about that. But anyway, uh, the original series, you and I did not experience the season finale as it aired live. We were, well, I was too young. You weren't even born yet. So no, I would have been like one and a half. So yeah, I was too young to watch it. But Turnabout Intruder. By the way, I put the episode descriptions here it came from IMDb just so everybody knows. I didn't write these myself. I'm not that good. <laughs> Captain Kirk's insane ex-lover, Dr. Janice Lester, forcibly switches bodies with him in order to take command of the Enterprise. So, Dan, how do you think this holds up as a series finale to the one that started it all, the original series? <laughs> well, I mean, okay, if we're going to be completely frank... I don't even think it holds up very well as a Star Trek episode, <laughs> let alone a season finale. <laughs> no, it's definitely not one that was like the final episode of the series was in mind when they wrote it, I don't think. There are obvious issues with this episode. There's some inherent sexism built into the episode that we've talked about even on this podcast in the past. Not the worst episode of the original series, but it is definitely in the bottom half, I would say. So, you know, kind of a bit of a sour note of the series to end on, unfortunately. I agree. I'm not a big fan of this episode. I don't like how Janice Lester makes a comment as if women aren't captains in Starfleet or allowed to be, and you can perceive that in different ways, you know, and then Wim Shatner pretending he's Janice Lester and 
sometimes, you know, in his Shatner way, feels like it's a little overacted at times. It's just not a good episode. But I'm trying to imagine at that time, and for those of you who did watch this as it aired, you go into and watch this like, this is the last Star Trek episode I'll ever see. This is the last new Star Trek. Because you didn't know there would be anything else coming. And then this is the last episode. And you're like, well, that was okay. Or, you know, it's just, yeah, they didn't do finales back then like they do now. There's a few exceptions to that. For example, The Fugitive was a series back then, which was one of the few that actually had a finale because it was a show where someone is chasing someone through every episode. So they ended the series with that person finally being caught. But usually when a series ended, it just ended on a regular episode. Yeah, there's one little part in this episode where I think they had it in their mind that this could be the final episode. And it's, I remember, and I'm looking through the transcript now and I can't remember exactly where it is or, or who says it, but I think it might be a conversation between Spock and Scotty or something where they're talking about Captain Kirk's odd behavior. And there's some mention made of like the years we've spent aboard this ship. We've done many missions and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, it just almost feels a little bit like there was some, you know, little bit paid to the fact that it was the final episode, but definitely not in any kind of structural way of how the episode plays out. That kind of sounds familiar to me. It's been a long time since I've watched that episode. I thought about rewatching all these episodes before we recorded, but I've seen a lot of them so many times and I just didn't have the time to do it. This is the last episode of a series, but I don't know if I would consider it what we would term a series finale. Yeah, definitely not in the modern sense in any way. Well, and that tradition continues on to the animated series. And so the animated series lasted for two seasons. It feels more like a season and a half. It was heavier in the first season and fewer episodes in the second. And the counterclock incident was the last episode of season two which was also the six episodes. So that just tells you there were only six episodes that season, but it also is the series finale. And here's the description from IMDb. The Enterprise finds itself trapped in a negative universe, which causes the crew to begin to grow younger and younger towards infancy. I threw it to you last time. I'll start my opinion on this one first. You know, again, this one isn't a great, it's not a finale. It doesn't conclude a storyline or something in the series. It's just another regular episode in the animated series. So technically I wouldn't consider this a finale, but I would just consider this the last episode of the series. The crew getting younger and turning into babies is kind of a fun idea in a way, but I also like this episode because of the introduction of April. Yeah, this is not a not a terrible episode. Again, like you say, not really a finale. I do like Robert April being a part of the story. The whole negative universe where like the the depths of space are shining white and the stars are all black doesn't really make a lot of sense to me visually or anything like that. So there's <laughs> right. you know, there's a lot that's kind of silly in the animated series and the original Star Trek series and all of the rest of Star Trek as well that, you know, you can kind of explain away scientifically and that sort of thing. This is just one that I have a problem with, I guess, but it doesn't halt my enjoyment of the episode because I do like a lot of the aspects of it. So, you know, kind of a memorable one to leave the animated series on. But again, like you say, not really a a true series finale. So I think it would be safe to say that these two finales that we've just discussed aren't going to be our favorites. No, I I think that's, yeah, that's fair. (laughs) Not our favorites. (laughs) So here's the question to you, Dan. Should we consider Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, the true finale to the original series? I think the spiritual series finale to the original Star Trek That makes sense. Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. It's got the wrap up. It's got the final, you know, Kirk even says in a log, this is the final cruise of the Enterprise under my command. And, uh, you know, we get that lovely bit where we see the cast signatures and everybody kind of poses for that shot on the bridge and Sulu flies off in the Excelsior off to his adventures. I think it really works as a finale to the original Star Trek. Yeah, and I remember watching this the weekend it came out, and it just felt that way. You know, I knew going in it was going to be the last of this original crew. It kind of, to me, does feel like it's the finale to this crew and to this series, but not the finale to a TV series, but the finale to this crew. 
Yeah, this this part of the Star Trek universe kind of thing. Yeah, and to these actors. Mm. Because we do get this crew again later in future movies, but a different cast playing them. But, you know, their signatures at the end of the movie really did make it feel like this is it. You know, we're seeing their goodbye on this. Yeah. Even though, in a sense, some of them still came back in some capacity, playing their characters and other things. But this is the last of the Enterprise with Captain Kirk at the helm and his crew played by this cast. So that being said, let's fast forward to TNG, The Next Generation. And so it went seven seasons and its series finale was the 25th episode of season seven called All Good Things. And IMDb has the description. It reads, Captain Picard finds himself shifting continually into the past, future and present and must use that to discover a threat to humanity's existence. Dan, does this episode hold up for you? <laughs> Very much so. I'm a huge fan of this episode. I remember, I don't know how many times I've watched it since it first aired, but I remember sitting down to watch this way back in the day. So excited, sad to see the end of Star Trek The Next Generation, but just so into this final episode. And the way it uses the past, the present, and the future and links back to the very beginning of the series. So much of this episode is just so burned into my memory is, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know how or why, but I'm moving back and forth through time. I just I, <laughs> so much of this episode. I love it, you know, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's so much fun. So great from start to finish. I absolutely love this episode. I do, too. I mean, to your point, I mean, the past, present and future, it was just kind of cool to see what the future might be. But it was also fun going back to the past. And it was like you were returning to the very first episode, Encounter at Farpoint, the pilot episode. And there's Tasha Yar and there's the older uniforms and. I mean, they did a great job making the bridge and the sets look as close as they could to how they looked in the original episode of, of the pilot. And it was just such a great homecoming. Also a look into the future of where these characters could end up and where they could be going. I mean, we find out, oh, well, Jean-Luc and Beverly married, but then they also got divorced, you know? It's like just seeing those things, there was so much, and it was two hours, and I mean, there was just a lot there. And... I love that Picard was the central character and we just went on that journey with him throughout the episode. Yeah, I love the episode. I remember thinking at the time, it's sad that the series is ending, but I also knew at the time when I'm watching the episode, this really isn't the end because I knew a movie was coming out with this crew. Yeah, there's definitely mixed feelings in it. You knew at the time that the movie was coming very shortly on the heels of this episode. Yeah, it, it it's incredible there's one glaring nit that i can find in the episode that still to this day just bugs me a little bit and i should have had the nitpickers guide out and ready to like read exactly about it but it's one of those issues script wise that if you if you try and fix it it makes the episode not work so i'm gonna get really into the nerdy weeds here but there's the anomaly in three different time periods and when the future pasteur gets to where it's supposed to be in the future there's nothing there and they scan for it and they can't find it and then later they they're destroyed and get rescued by the Enterprise. And they say, okay, well, what happens if we go back now? And Data says, if we go back now, we'll see the beginnings of this anomaly. But that's not right. The anomaly gets bigger as it goes back in time. So the anomaly shouldn't be there now. It should have been there when they first got there. And then when they scanned it, it should disappear. So it, that doesn't make sense. But that's okay. That's fine. That's it's one of those ones that makes the episode not work if you if you get too into the weeds about it. Because <laughs> you just assume Data was wrong. He didn't know what he was talking about. Well, he did know what he was talking about because they got there and the anomaly was there. But it doesn't make sense. It shouldn't be. <laughs> it just oh, yeah. makes the episode not make sense. But that's okay. I thought you were going to say the thing that didn't make sense is Worf and Troy kissing in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, maybe it was the age I was when these were airing. I was into Worf and Troy. I thought that was an okay relationship. Yeah, I didn't really have a problem with it. I, do, I know some people do. And it's not my preferred relationship. But yeah, I didn't have a big problem with it. And I know better... It's not a hallway. It's a corridor. <laughs> you know, I, I do get that. So, but now here we have the interesting situation we had before when we said about the undiscovered country. Is that truly the finale 
to the original series. So my question to you is, is Star Trek Nemesis the true finale to TNG? I mean, definitionally speaking, I suppose it could be the true finale, whatever that means, but it's not a good finale. (laughs) I think All Good Things is the good finale. You know, Nemesis, the one thing that kind of bugs me about it is how much they were hedging their bets and just kind of like playing it like, oh, maybe it's the last one, maybe not. But they were like, oh, if it does really good, we'll do another one. So much so that the tagline they came up with for the movie was a generation's final journey begins. So if the movie did really well, they'd be like, well, the next one would be a generation's final journey continues. And I'm like, oh, come on, guys, make a commitment. Like either this is the last one or it's not, you know, bet on your movie doing well or don't. Sorry, that's a little nitpick that I have with with the whole marketing behind that movie. And also, I I just I don't feel like it's a great send off for our cast personally. Yeah, as you're talking through it, I'm thinking about what we said earlier about the original series, that when that ended, the TV series itself with Turnabout Intruder, it wasn't set up to be a finale. It's just the last episode of the series. It's not a wrap up. It's not it's not doing a curtain call at the end that this is the end of the series. It's just another episode just happens to be the last one where when we get to all good things it is created to be the finale it is the thing to wrap up the series it's a way to say goodbye where then when we go to the movie versions of stuff with the original series with the undiscovered country it was intended to be the last and to your point though with nemesis it was a maybe it's the last and maybe it's not so it doesn't really come across necessarily as a finale Mm -hmm. as as much as all good things does Absolutely. So, yeah. But yeah, I'm not a hater of Nemesis. You know, I, I think it's okay. I remember at the time when that movie came out, to your point about the final journey, maybe beginning, whatever, and all that stuff. And I remember watching the movie thinking, well, this may be the last one and it may not be. We don't know. But when I watched The Undiscovered Country, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this is the last time we'll ever see this crew. Oh, so sad. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, and, and for the record, I, I I wouldn't say I'm a Nemesis hater, but it is definitely my least favorite of the TNG films. Yeah, I think a lot of people would agree with that, except for Amy Nelson, friend of the show. <laughs> but now, Deep Space Nine, this is the last time we get to see them, is in the series finale. And it did go seven seasons, and its last episode was the 25th episode of the seventh season, What You Leave Behind. And the IMDb description states... As the Dominion War comes to an end, Dukat goes to the Pa Wraiths to awaken them. Meanwhile, the Dominion turn on the rebelling Cardassians, destroying them city by city. Will the Alliance prevail over the Dominion? Will Garrick and the Rebellion stop them before the destruction of Cardassia? Will Sisko stop the Pa Wraiths from rising? Well, I let you go first last time, so I'll go first this time on this one. And I will say that I thought this was a great finale to Deep Space Nine. The difference between this finale and All Good Things is the All Good Things finale didn't necessarily tie to the previous episode, where What You Leave Behind was really not just the finale to a series, but was also a finale to a storyline, especially in that last season. I'm wondering if this is the kind of series finale we'll see for a lot of the more modern Star Treks that have like an ongoing storyline for the season. So it will have the dual job of wrapping up the current goings on, but also having to wrap up the series as a whole. So I'm curious when we get to Discovery and Picard's finales, whenever they may be, what that'll look like. But yeah, in this case, I think this is a terrific series finale. There, It's not perfect. There's some issues with it, but... I I think it's a wonderful wrap up. I still get misty eyed during that final bit where, first of all, where Vic Fontaine is singing the way you look tonight, that whole scene. But then also when that music comes up again during the montage, showing the memories of the crew. Great stuff. This one really does wrap up Deep Space Nine in a bow. You know, I, I think some of the reused visual effects and the fact that they couldn't use Jadzia Dax's image in those memories, those are the two strikes I would have against it, but unavoidable kind of things that are the reality of making television at that time in the 90s and actor contracts and all that stuff. So uh, yeah, great, great, great finale to a favorite series of mine. So definitely a special place in my heart for this one. 
I'm glad you brought Jed Z and Dax up because you're right. That's one thing that really bothers me about this episode is when Worf is getting ready to leave and he sees Ezri Dax and he reflects back on Dax. It's only of Ezri and not his wife, Jed Zia. And it's so odd that I thought it would have just been better if they didn't even do the flashback at that moment with Worf. I think it would have worked better if Worf had looked back, saw Ezri and just took a moment and stood there and they look at each other and you can just see him thinking back and reflecting and then stepping away to leave and not showing any flashbacks to the point that you could be watching that thinking, oh, he's probably thinking of Jadzia right now. Yeah. And I mean, most of the flashbacks that we saw were of like the last six episodes for War, Right. Which is like, yeah. it's, it's a little jarring. It's a little weird. I would love to see, you know, I I know there's no money to do it anywhere, but like if they could go back and just re-edit that slightly or, I don't know, just put in Jadzia. I'm sure she'd be fine with it. Just ask. She'd be fine. Yeah, I would say take out the flashbacks or like you're saying, insert some Jadzia scenes or at least one, you know, something, just her face or something, you know, but yeah. But outside of that, I thought the episode's great. The montage you're saying about really was nice. I mean, it was just like, this final moment. It's like that whole thing I was saying about the end of the undiscovered country, but with the signatures, you know, this was kind of like, yeah, we know this is the end. We're going to reflect back on things. It was a touching episode at the end. It, it, it really kind of brought a little tear to me. eye. but yeah, I would say this is a really good finale. Absolutely. Yeah. And the last time we see our Voyager crew is in their series finale. Again, they went seven seasons and this is the 25th episode of season seven. And this series finale is called Endgame. And the IMDb description says, having long since made it home, an aged Admiral Janeway breaks Starfleet directives and temporal laws to take a last stab at an old enemy and shorten Voyager's journey home. So Dan, how does this stack up? Ooh, that's interesting the way you phrase that. How does it stack up? I I think as a finale to Voyager, it's not bad. It's it's fine. (laughs) It's not my favorite. How does it stack up? I think TNG and DS9's finales blow it out of the water personally, but uh, that that's fine. You know, there there's different choices I would have made if I were writing it. He says having no television writing experience whatsoever and in being in no position whatsoever to judge on that level. But the the whole idea of Voyager kind of changing all of history in order to come back. A little earlier, I can see why some people have an issue with that type of storytelling and it kind of being a little bit out of left field. Uh, The other thing, the other very common complaint, of course, about the episode is that they get back to the Alpha Quadrant and then that's it. Like we don't see anything more of, you know, any kind of homecoming or anything like that. So there's some issues with it. I think, again, for Voyager, for the series Voyager was... I feel like it fits, if that makes sense. It kind of fits with how they told stories and how they were wanting to tell stories. So, yeah, it's fine. It's okay. I enjoy watching it when it comes up in my rewatch. But it's not one that I seek out often to enjoy on its own merits, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I think I like it a little better than you do. Uh, I, I wouldn't put it up there as high as All Good Things, which I would probably say is my favorite But it's definitely up there. I love aspects of it with the Borg and the Borg Queen. I kind of like the whole Admiral Janeway relationship with Captain Janeway. But that's also one of the things I like least about it is Admiral Janeway coming back to the past to get them home sooner. Because I'm like, oh, so you cheated, you know? And it's like you broke the temporal directives. And I'm like, I would have liked to have seen Captain Janeway do it herself, and not have her future self help her. I would have loved to have seen that she figured out a way to get them back home and she got it done and not have her future self come back to the past and try to erase what was done and correct it and get them home. Not that it's a big complaint, but I just kind of wish that it was more of Janeway just standing on her own and she would never go back to the past and create a whole new timeline, which then creates a whole nother thing that I am interested in. I would love to see a comic or a novel That shows us the time that they did get to get back to the Alpha Quadrant in Admiral Janeway's timeline. You Mm. know, I mean, we got little hints and storylines about how that happened, but it's like there's there's a number of years there where there's like a whole nother timeline of Voyager in the Delta Quadrant before it got home. 
And I was like, what happened during that? Like, I'd love to see that. I mean, because in a lot of ways, when we see Endgame, this is an alternate timeline. I want to see the original timeline past season seven. Yeah, that would be interesting. It was, you know, they I think they spent 20 years still trying to get back or 20 plus years. So, yeah, there are a lot of adventures there that we didn't see. And of course, the the Tuvok getting progressively more sick and Chakotay and Seven of Nine passing away and stuff. So, yeah, a lot of differences in that timeline for sure. To your point, I would have loved to have seen them get back home as opposed to just they get to the Alpha Quadrant and they're escorted towards Earth. I can understand probably why they didn't do that. It kind of left it up to the imagination because then it's like, oh, they're back. Okay, now what are we going to do? Just show them hanging out at Starfleet or doing, you know, like, like to me, there's a whole nother several episodes there. It may have made sense to go ahead and have them return home a few episodes earlier. And then there's like this story arc over two or three episodes of them dealing with being back home. But then again, I, I can see where they're like, well, how do you then do a season finale? They've already been home, you know? Yeah. So I, I kind of get it. But I wasn't too disappointed that, but I would have liked to have seen them reach Earth. Yeah. The one story I always remember about this finale as well is Garrett Wong at a convention was talking about filming that scene where they get home and the camera was going around the bridge getting reaction shots. And Garrett was like, oh, I'll, I'll get choked up. And do a little bit of a, a sob that like, oh, we're home. And he did that. And the director and everyone was like, oh, that was amazing. That was great. We love it. Uh, and then he watched the final episode when they cut it all together and they had moved that reaction shot from them arriving home to hearing Tom and Bolana's baby over the intercom. And it goes to Garrett and he sobs a little bit and he's like i don't care about some stupid baby what the hell? <laughs> that was oh they changed it so and that's one story i remember every time i watch that i have that in the back of my mind he's not crying about the baby he's crying about getting home <laughs> <laughs> i do remember hearing that oh, that's funny well that just shows what editing can do <laughs> mm -hmm. absolutely well, let's go to our last series finale, and this is for Star Trek Enterprise. It ran for four seasons, and this finale is the 22nd episode of season four. These are the voyages, and the, and the IMDb description says, In 2370, Commander William T. Riker is trying to clear his mind and relives the last mission of the first Enterprise on the holodeck. Wait, did I read the right description? This sounds like a TNG episode. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, lots of size here. I think we already know how you feel, Dan. I've heard you talk about this, mate. Actually, you never talk about it, which tells me a lot. So now you have to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so when it first came out, it was generally reviled by Star Trek fandom. A lot of people felt hurt by it in that it was more of a Star Trek The Next Generation episode rather than a Star Trek Enterprise episode. And I know cast members of Enterprise have come out since it aired saying that they felt hurt by it, that they never got a real final episode. Instead, this episode focusing on Riker and Troy Years later, looking back on it, I'm a little bit more forgiving. I still, I don't think it's a good episode. Like there are so many things in it that I really dislike. I dislike what they did with Tripp's character for what seems to be just shock value. Uh, I dislike, of course, that it doesn't focus on our crew of the Enterprise NX-01, I should say. But at the same time, I get a little bit more of what they were trying to do. This was the culmination of 18 years of Star Trek on television. So we kind of talked about how the Deep Space Nine finale had the dual role of wrapping up the series Deep Space Nine, as well as the storyline they were currently on. This one, I feel like they felt had to wrap up the series Enterprise, but also the Berman era of Star Trek, as we call it now. This is the end of his time being in charge of Star Trek on television and the end of Star Trek on television for quite a while. So I get what they were trying to do. They called it a love letter to Star Trek fans. And I think a lot of people did not take it as such. There's not much in this episode that's going to make me like it. I do like seeing Jonathan Frakes and Marina Sirtis reprise their roles. I love the exterior shots of the Enterprise D that we get, you know, the CGI beautiful model and stuff. But I'm never going to think it's a good episode and I'm certainly never going to think it's a good end to Star Trek Enterprise. And I feel like that series deserved 
a much better ending than it got here. Have I gone back and watched this episode? Yes, multiple times. For what it's what it is and where it's placed in Enterprise, I think it's ins- it's a bit insulting to the series. If it were kind of maybe in the middle of the se- series somewhere or something like that, and they redid some of the stuff with Trip. I'd enjoy it a lot more, if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. I'm glad to hear you say that. I, I've wondered what you've thought about. I know you didn't care for it. I know you don't like like it, but I, I like hearing your thoughts more about that. So, yeah, I watched this at the time that it aired. And for me, I was more forgiving of it. It didn't bother me when I watched it. At the time, I, I remember thinking it wasn't a great episode. I thought it was an okay episode. I did enjoy it because I did enjoy seeing Riker and Troy. That was fun. And seeing the Enterprise D again, I thought that was pretty cool from a fan standpoint. I didn't necessarily feel that the crew or the cast were being cheated, but I can see that now. I mean, at the time, I wasn't really thinking so much about it because this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the original series. There's some series that are very episodic and more so nowadays are very serialized. And most of Star Trek at this time wasn't serialized. It was episodic. So, yeah, there's some differences, you know, when it comes to some Enterprise, especially the Zindi arc. And then there's mini arcs in season four. And of course, Deep Space Nine had some serialized uh, episodes and seasons in there. But to me, again, it was like just a standalone episode. So do you treat the last episode as a finale or do you just give it as a regular episode? And this definitely was intended to be a finale. But at the same time, when I was watching it, I wasn't thinking this is the last of this crew. It's the last time we'll see this crew on screen. But I knew that they would continue on into books and such, because if anything, the thing I was more disappointed about is we didn't get another season and we didn't see the Romulan War. And so this episode seemed like we're being, not this episode, but I felt like the series is being cut short. Mm -hmm. And so when this episode premiered, what I did like about it is I see that this crew, this NX-01 crew has lived on in history and that the future doesn't forget about them. Because when we watch TNG, Voyager, and Deep Space Nine, Enterprise hadn't existed yet. So there's no references to Archer and their crew. And it's almost like, did they forget about them? And now it was like, you know what? They have lived on. Two centuries later, there's somebody that's reflecting back on on the accomplishments of this crew and what they've done to help start the Federation. So I thought it was a good way to honor Enterprise when I watched it. And yes, it didn't feel like a total Enterprise episode, but to your point, it was ending that Berman era, so to speak. And so it did work as a love letter to me. Yeah, I didn't think it was a great episode. I didn't think it was all that compelling. I didn't like how they handled Trip, where he just all of a sudden is like, oh, I'll save you, Captain. I'm going to go sacrifice myself. Let's out of the blue. Like, like it was like, I remember at the time going, this is very jarring. This doesn't feel quite like Trip. There were things that, yeah, it wasn't a great episode, but it doesn't bother me. I don't hate it. I'm not bashing it. It was just one of those mediocre episodes. But yeah, as a finale, it wasn't it wasn't the best. Yeah, I, I like that insight to, you know, acknowledging Enterprise's place in Star Trek history more so than it had been before. That's a really good point. I like that. Uh, the other thing, and, you know, some would say it's minor. Some would say it's not minor. The one Another thing that bugged me was this episode takes place 10 years after the last time we saw the Enterprise crew and Trip and, or sorry, Travis and Hoshi are both still ensigns. I'm like, yeah, really? that bothered me too. That's even worse than Harry Kim. Like, that's bad. <laughs> but anyway. yeah, I think it's what the opening scene. We see it right away. Yeah. It's like, where's the pips? Like, they're still, they're still in the same positions. Come on. They're still the same rank. 10 years later. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, actually, it's not quite. T- it's less than 10 years because it was in 2161. Oh, yeah. So 10 years since the start of Enterprise. The start of. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that 10 year span, they never got promoted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is the Harry Kim syndrome. Uh, so. And I think even the the books that kind of retcon the whole trip thing, which if people out there, if you haven't read these, you should. Uh, I think they're really good. Uh, they do retcon it also that this doesn't take place in 2161. It actually takes place in like 2156 or something like right after. And yeah. this is, you know, the negotiation of the coalition compact, not the Federation one. And, and the holodeck program was flawed and, and didn't reflect accurately history or something like that. So 
is that yeah. that's an interesting retcon that I think a lot of people miss reading those books as well that they actually changed the time that this episode takes place in. Yeah, it actually confuses me a little because anytime I see this episode, I do think it takes place in that 21, 55, 56, whatever. And I'm like, oh, wait, the episode really does want to say it takes place in 2161. But in my mind, it doesn't because the books to me are real. Like when I watch this episode, I think of those books. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. And you didn't sign up to downloading this particular podcast to get spoilers for the books. So I'm not going to spoil exactly how they do it. But what happens with Trip is significantly altered by what you see in the episode versus what ha- what they explain happens in the books. So uh, I'll just leave it there and, and definitely check those books out. So the last full measure kind of references this, the, the Enterprise novel, and then the book that explains everything is called The Good That Men Do, and it's by uh, Michael A. Martin and Andy Mangles. Good books, really good. Uh, yeah, I've read them twice, and we actually covered them on Literary Treks. So yeah. So I'm going to wonder, I'm going to guess here. Can I guess what you're ranking now? I don't like to do ranks, honestly, but I'm going <laughs> to try to guess what your ranking is. Sure. I'm going to say that These Are the Voyages is definitely not the top of your list. I'm going to guess it's All Good Things is your favorite, followed by What You Leave Behind, followed by Endgame, and this is where I'm struggling. I'm going to say, uh, these are the voyages, the counterclock incident, and then turn about a truder. That's probably as good as any ranking I could come up with. Those top three are absolutely correct. Uh, the bottom three, it depends on mood, what mood I'm in, I guess. <laughs> They're kind of all just kind of down there a bit. No, but my favorite is absolutely all good things. I think that is the pinnacle of Star Trek series finales. What You Leave Behind does a really good job of getting close, and I really, really love it. But yeah, all good things just has to uh, has to edge it out as far as entertainment value and ambition and how it reflects the series that it's wrapping up. Well, I have to agree with you because when I realized I started trying to guess your ranking, it really turned out to be my ranking at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, All Good Things, I think, is an excellent finale. I-, I can't think of it to be any better than what it is. And like you said, What You Leave Behind, very close to that, too. There's nothing here that I don't like. It's just, there's some that, well, I, I have to say, I'm not a big fan of Turnabout Intruder. <laughs> no, just not. not really. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if it's a finale or not, just as a regular episode, I'm not a big fan of it. But, you know, I'll watch it. As a matter of fact, I should probably watch it again. It's been a long time since I've seen it. But yeah, I love Star Trek, you know, and there's going to be some really good ones and there's not going to be, and there's going to be some really not so good ones. And, you know, that's just how it is when you've got, what is it now, over a hundred episodes out there, you're not going to have them all winners. <laughs> I think there's uh, over 800 episodes out there now. What did I say? A hundred. <laughs> oh, I meant to say 800. <laughs> uh, yes, because I know we just had that 800 episode on uh, Discovery recently. Yeah, no, it's a big milestone for sure. There's, there's somebody calculated exactly how much time it, it would take to watch all of Star Trek, and I should try and find that and mention that next episode. I was gonna mention that. I saw that article just last night, and I was gonna mention <laughs> it here on the show. I remember them saying, I can't remember if you watched it nonstop how long it would take, but they said, of course, you know, you have to sleep and eat and other things. But they said, you know, a good year and a half it would take for you probably to watch if you were consistently every day watching. Yeah, and you'd have to amount. still devote a lot of time to watching Star Trek if you were to make a year and a half, I think, too. Yeah, that's just crazy. And, it, and, you know, I used to think, wow, there's so many novels. But, I mean, we have almost as many novels as we have filmed Star Trek. It's crazy. Yep, it's we're, it's an embarrassment of riches of Star Trek. Yes, I am not complaining, and there's more to come, and I love it. So, Dan, when people want to talk to you about all good things, or maybe even talk to you about These Are the Voyages, where can they find you? I'm always open to discussing all things Star Trek. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats. That's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. YouTube.com slash Kurtrats Productions, making videos mostly about Star Trek. And uh, yeah, anywhere you search for Kurtrats or Kurtrats 47, that's probably me. So uh, how about you, Bruce? Where can people get in touch with you? I'm on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. Of course, I'm in our Positively Trek Facebook group, and I'm occasionally on the Star Wars Report podcast. 
And you can email us, PositivelyTrek at gmail.com and follow us on Twitter at PositivelyTrek and also on Instagram at PositivelyTrek. But yeah, look for our Facebook group. Uh, the discussion group is very active and very positive. It's a safe place. And if it becomes unsafe, we're kicking those people out. It's just as simple as that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, that hasn't happened yet. So, But thanks, everyone, for joining us. And uh, join us next week and uh, stay positive out there because, you know, it's a whole new year and it's a good time to stay positive if you haven't been staying positive. So that's the last time I'm going to say stay positive. Thank you.